a five minute break approximately halfway through the webinar. Um, if you do have to get up and get a refill on coffee or something while a speaker is going, um, don't worry, you won't miss anything because the webinar is being recorded um, and we'll send a link to you. So this is especially great if you're thinking so quickly um, along with what people are saying and asking, um, you can always go back and relook at it. Furthermore, we are on Twitter. Um, so please, if you'd like to join into the conversation with that, use the hashtag SOASW2020. Um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, we have, we're trying something new this year. Um, we have a Padlet that you can just go into and put the questions there. However, if you only have one screen and you don't like toggling between Zoom and the, um, your internet browser, that's okay. Um, you can always put your question into the chat and one of our chat moderators will grab that um, for you. At the end of the webinar is when we'll be answering all of the questions. So don't worry if you have a question for the first or second speaker. Um, we promise we will get to your question, um, but we'll only be taking questions at the end. Thank you, Stacy. Stacy's kindly put the link to the Padlet in the chat. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, today, we have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you. Um, we first have Natalie Fritz, um, who is the curator of the Library and Archives for the Clark County Historical Society at the Heritage Center in Springfield, where she has been for 14 years. She holds a degree in history from Kent State University and a master's in public history from Wright State University. She serves on the board of the Ohio Local History Alliance as a representative for Region 7, where she is a member of the Advocacy Committee and is co-chair of the Society of Ohio Archivists Advocacy and Outreach Committee. At the Heritage Center, she manages the, His the Historical Society's research library and handles community outreach related to the collections. Following Natalie, we will have Steve Amadown, um, who has been the Manuscripts and Outreach Archivist for the Brown Popular Cultural Culture Library since 2016. He received his Master of Library Science degree from the University of Maryland College Park in 2014. Steve was the Romance Writers of America's Kathy Lynn's Librarian of the Year in 2019 for his work in preserving and promoting the history of the romance genre. His work includes running the Brown Popular, Popular Culture Library's social media presence which has been an invaluable tool for raising the profile of the library with both researchers and the general public. Following Steve, we'll have our five minute break and then we'll have Jennifer Baker and Jen Hanny Conover joining us. Uh, Jennifer Baker has been the deputy archivist at Warren County for the past five years. She received her bachelor's degree in history from Miami University and her master's degree in public history from Wright State University. Jen is the Director of Records Management and Archives at Warren County, Ohio, where she has been for seven years. She has a bachelor's in history from Miami University and a master's in public history also from Wright State University. Um, and kind of wrapping it up for us is Miriam Itrider, who has been the Special Collections Librarian for Rare Books at Ohio University's Mann Center for Archives and Special Collections for over six years. She is also liaison librarian to the university's honors program and dedicates much of her time during the academic year to instruction and outreach. So we're really excited. Um, without further ado, Natalie. Let me get this started. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy to be here with you guys. I'm actually at work today for the first time in several weeks because I have two kids at home that cannot possibly um, leave me alone for more than two minutes to not uh, pop in. So I decided I had to come here to do this. Uh, 
I've been at the Clark County Historical Society for 14 years. Um, I started all of our uh, social media accounts and uh, as Steve will talk about in the next one, decided that there was some that uh, it was not worth the time to, to continue with. Uh, so I, uh, we focus mainly on, on, on just a few. Uh, we're located downtown in uh, Springfield in this 130 year old historic building. Um, we're one of the few that has survived downtown. We've seen a lot uh, come down in just in the last few years. Uh, but we have a museum on the west end of the building on the first and second floor and an annex. And then our collection storage is on the second floor. And then our, our research library and archives where I spend my time is on third floor on the east end of the building. Uh, we have five full-time staff and three part-time. And there are three of us in the curatorial department, but I'm the one that's um, dedicated to the archives. Uh, we have about 80 volunteers, uh, mostly retirees, who work at the, our front desk in the museum as docents in collections there and in the archives. Each semester, we also have a handful of Wittenberg students who work with us completing their community service requirements. And we occasionally have interns from Wright State and elsewhere. My usual day-to-day -day work is uh, managing the library and archives, assisting researchers, which is um, one of my favorite parts, overseeing processing and indexing projects. I rarely get to actually do any of those myself anymore. I also do most of our basic marketing flyers and such for uh, events and things that we do. I manage our website and I do community outreach through our local newspaper, um, doing regular uh, weekly features multiple days a week and all of our social media outreach. I've always made it a point with our outreach to stick to a regular posting schedule with set weekly posts because I have limited time and I know that at least I can stick to a regular schedule. I try to make things as simple as possible. Um, I go for the low hanging fruit. I share stuff on the fly, uh, things that are connected to new donations, researcher discoveries, outside research requests, um, and collections and process, process. I often try and stack planned posts that I have to work across multiple areas. Um, so I can share things within a short time span. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I wanted to share this background as to what I do as our, our before um, to demonstrate how that way of working um, with the low hanging fruit was, uh, became even more important starting last year uh, at the museum. Uh, if you want to imagine this slide as, as the night before, this is actually taken after nine o'clock. Um, so we can imagine this about nine o'clock on Thursday, April 25th, 2019. Uh, this is later that evening. Uh, I received a call from my boss uh, around 1130, looked down at my phone and said to my husband, I, sh I should answer that, shouldn't I? Uh, this can't be good. And uh, I was told that there had been a major leak and uh, that I should probably get down there. Uh, so 15 minutes later, I walked into this scene on our east end of the building um, with water on the floor in the lobby. Um, I took the elevator up to the second floor and realized that water was pouring in the elevator and got up to the second floor where my boss assured me that uh, the archives were okay, but the, we needed to focus on the second floor collections area. So this is me um, following my boss down the hall. And this is one that I wish was a, uh, a video <laughs> so you could get the full effect of um, the fact that it was raining in the building. Um, what had happened was uh, a pipe in the wall on the third floor in the archives um, in, a, in a enclosed wall had fallen, uh, broken, pressurized, and pumped uh, 700 gallons of water throughout the east end of the building straight down. So uh, that first evening, we focused on uh, clearing out the collections rooms as much as we could. Uh, we have seven rooms down this hallway that you see here. Um, and this is one of the rooms where I, you probably can't see it very well, but these boxes have already uh, collapsed under water weight. Um, so we spent that time pulling out as many tables as we could and using our, our we have a big um, open room where we use for programming that's beyond the, the collections area um, that we started setting stuff up in there. Uh, so uh, this up here, you can see this is a few days later, um, all of our damaged boxes where we have removed everything, laid stuff out to dry, marked them and uh, made lists of what boxes needed to be replaced. In the middle here is me in a mask before it was cool. Um, those first few days, uh, the ceilings were in danger of caving in in a couple of the rooms and, and we weren't sure what exactly was, was in the air. So we, we had masks. 
uh, to protect ourselves then. Um, so this room here is where we, we started to collect everything. We had our, all of our collections on tables and under the tables here was where the archives went. And uh, you remember I told you they said that the, the archives were, were okay. Uh, well, the archives were not okay. Um, we were lucky in that we didn't lose um, much collections. Most of the damage to boxes was from splash up from water on the floor as the fire department was pushing water out. But the floor damage was uh, catastrophic enough that they had to replace the floors, which meant we had to move absolutely everything. Uh, so about four days after we had after it had happened um, and we had been moving stuff on the second floor, we had to start moving stuff in the archives so that they could start work up there as well. Uh, there was some stuff we realized right away we couldn't keep on site, so we moved our probate records um, to off-site storage, which was about 500 boxes. Uh, the, we had uh, we filled the collections uh, research room where or, or the, we filled the library um, with as many boxes as we could, which meant um, obviously we were going to have to close the library um, even to volunteers because there wasn't any place for anybody to work anymore. Um, this is our first floor, uh, usually a meeting room. We had tables in there with collections on the tables and along the walls and under the tables was where we had all of the archival boxes. I tried to keep stuff together as much as I could. Uh, these white labels show which categories things are so that um, I had uh, the ability to access stuff somewhat if needed. Um, I could get to some things because um, I knew right off the bat I, I did not want to lose our ability to share our collection and to do our regular features in the paper because that's what keeps us visible in the community. So I spent a lot of time those um, first few days on top of moving constantly, um, taking pictures of as many things as I could. Um, as we emptied stuff from boxes, I took pictures of artifacts that I knew I could use later. I um, grabbed little pictures of things from the archives. Um, we had to close the museum for a month. You can see down here, uh, we had to move some of the archival material out into the museum for, for a short period um, until we could do more condensing and get stuff up. So um, we, unfortunately, last year also had to be closed during our, what was normally our busiest time of the year. We were, we were closed for the month of May. Um, so I spent a lot of time um, just trying to work with, with what we had, um, reverting back to what, what I had done before. Um, it, uh, as much as possible so that we could still um, keep up with regular features and we re reused a lot of things that we had used in past posts, um, pull pictures that we maybe hadn't used before. Um, we got through 2019, they rebuilt um, the second floor, uh, replaced everything in the archives and I was able to move everything back. Uh, we were able to reset the archives and get all the shelving back up by the end of July but we weren't able to reopen because I had to then turn my focus back down to the second floor to help um, clear the room that we had filled and then get everything back into the collection storage area. So we didn't actually open the archives back up to the public until November, although we were allowed to um, start bringing volunteers back to work and work on projects starting in June as we, had, as we were able to clear space and access the boxes that they needed to, to work on projects that they had been working on. Uh, so we got through that year. We said, okay, 2020 is going to be great. We'll, we'll be able to focus on the second floor. Um, Virginia and Casey are um, the curators, uh, people in the curatorial department, and we knew that they had a lot of volunteers that were raring to get in and help them do a lot of the repacking that they were going to need to do from um, temporarily packed boxes. Um, we'd already made plans to have a big one-year anniversary celebration um, where we would invite people in and have a big party. Um, do kind of an open house, show people what had happened, where we were at, where we were going. Um, but as you all know, <laughs> by early March, everybody kind of started to realize that the year was not going to go the way we, we had intended. Um, <clears throat> by the second week of March, I was at home, um, working from home with, with two kids, also trying to do school from home. So um, that's when I really buckled down on the, okay, we'll just work with what we have. Um, that first week, I was excited to see the um, offerings that places like QZM had for webinars. I signed up for everything that I could as far as getting ideas for how to connect uh, during this time. Um, got some great ideas there. Um, the most interesting thing I found during that first week was 
um, the first webinar, the, the, someone had said, this is a great time to try all sorts of new things, you know, just run with things. Don't worry about um, planning and development, just, just run with it. You know, this is a good time to test things out. People are at home, they want content, they want to see stuff. Um, the second week I attended a similar webinar um, through QZM and someone said, maybe we need to chill down, chill out a little bit. Don't worry about trying to do everything. Um, we might be here a little bit longer than we anticipated and you don't want to burn out too quickly. So um, over the past few weeks, I've been watching a lot of those about um, collections care, reopening and more as I'm sure a lot of you have been doing. Um, but I did get a lot of ideas that I decided to brace, embrace. Um, the main thing was buckling down on what we normally do. Um, these are the normal features that we send to the paper, um, a regular historic photo um, that runs on Mondays. On Thursdays, they do a then and now. And on uh, Fridays, we would do a feature from the museum. And last year when we were closed, um, I made sure that when we did the Friday museum feature that I would feature collections, something that was not on display because I didn't want to encourage people to a visit uh, while we were not there. So I've been doing a lot more of that as well, um, pulling items that I previously featured like as a, our, our collection spotlights that we do on Saturdays. I'm, I'm sending those to the paper to kind of um, save a little bit of time and effort um, to share things that we, we, some people may have seen in the past, but maybe they didn't hit the same audience as the newspaper. <clears throat> so I know I can reach different audiences that way. Um, this is our regular Wednesday feature. We'll do a who, a what, or a where is it and have people guess what it is. Um, so I've been, trying to line those up a lot more um, recently. If I, for example, you know, our where is it will most likely be sent to the paper the following week as a then and now, um, if I can manage it, um, and I can use the same um, captions and writing um, to save time. Um, another example of our weekly posts is our Saturday spotlights, um, where we highlight new donations. This is one I really didn't want to lose either. But last year, we had to stop donations completely between um, May and November as we were dealing with our uh, water disaster. Um, so what I did then was um, usually I'll just I'll highlight, you know, a single uh, donation. We never mentioned the donors, but we'll say, you know, this came from a collection. We might it has multiple things. We'll, we'll talk about what variety of things were in that donation. But what I started doing instead was taking pictures of just about everything um, and highlighting them across multiple weeks, not necessarily mentioning that it was all from the same donor, uh, just so that we could still highlight stuff, um, because I knew we were gonna start running low on, on new things to highlight um, if I just um, lumped everything together. Um, this is an example of one that, was, that came in um, just before all of this. Um, it was a dress that had been, on, had been donated to an old Mr. Rogers show, and I had highlighted it on, um, on a Saturday on our page, along with a letter that came with it, the original handwritten note from the person who had made it, and a couple other materials, and then I turned around and used the same caption to send to the paper. Um, so we could reuse that. Uh, <clears throat> as we were going into the spring, there was a lot of things that we knew we were going to be losing um, that we normally do. Um, we have an annual Peeps in History where we'll recreate a historic scene out of Peeps. And I have really wonderful volunteers that get really excited and start planning all the, the props and things that are needed. And they'd already, um, we'd already planned what we were going to do for this year, which was. Um, very timely, it was supposed to be a recreation of the building that's next to our building um, that had been renovated and was reopening as a marketplace and co-working space. Um, they've all been um, shut down too. So um, when we realized we were gonna have to scrap the peeps, I was, we were sad, uh, but we, we had already told our volunteers um, that we were gonna be closing at least to volunteers and then we ended up closing uh, completely um, the next week. So my um, brilliant husband who said he definitely needs to get the credit for this, um, said that since I'd already bought the peeps and some of the props that we could do peeps in quarantine, which I decided to uh, kill two birds with one stone with that and entertain my kids. So I let my fifth grader um, come up with all the ideas of what we could do. We used her old dollhouse furniture and, and stuff and um, we're able to kind of give her some experience doing some stuff. This, this one up here was actually a stop motion video, which um, she was excited to do because she had planned to do a um, program at the library, local library that was on stop motion video and they'd had to cancel that. So we made a little stop motion video for our peeps here. Um, she also has been doing a lot of the Girl Scouts of Western Ohio um, have been doing online badges um, throughout the weeks. And uh, this was one where they were making a boat and she said, oh, we can put the peep on here. So we, we've been 
um, trying to uh, do that. And that, that's another um, organization that I've been talking to since I'm also a Girl Scout leader about how we can do some, some programming in the future with Girl Scouts um, virtually. Um, other things, we just started kind of throwing the peeps into anything we were doing at home. There, you know, we've got Zooming, we were doing lots of puzzles, so we've got peeps doing puzzles. And then my daughter sent me this little George Peepington here. This was all her. <laughs> she, she, she was very sad when I told her at Easter that we were going to need to stop doing those. But this was the, um, the one time that we kind of uh, brought back our Instagram page. That was one that I had decided um, it wasn't worth the effort. It, most of our audience is on Facebook and the interaction is there. Um, but I, I shared all of our peeps and a few other things to Instagram at this time. Um, another thing that I was able to revamp was we, we normally do a uh, spring March Madness. And since the real March Madness was canceled and our program that we were going to base this around, um, our March this year it was going to be based on um, characters at our annual Night at the Museum program where we have historic figures. Um, and we were going to, you know, have people pick who they would most like to meet. Um, so we we already knew that we were probably going to have to scrap the, the program. And then when we did, I said, okay, I guess we'll scrap the, the history madness. Um, and that week between when the schools closed and uh, when they told everybody in Ohio to stay home, um, we decided, I decided to go ahead and um, pull all of the captions and photos that I had been sending to the paper all the years about the museum and do a March Madness about the museum. Um, it was, wasn't very much work. It was just a couple hours to throw together in a, you know, um, editing program um, online just to, to toss the pictures in and the captions and then we had a way that we could allow people into the museum virtually and, and let them choose some of their favorites and we had a lot of our our regular followers that interact with us a lot we're excited to see that um, and I'm really glad that I did this because yesterday I got a call from Wittenberg University who's moving forward with their summer internship program and normally they would come visit the museum and um, the library and archives and tour with us but since we're still closed and they won't be able to do that. They asked if we could do something virtually. And I said, I have all of these slides that I've already made. So we can, I can um, put that together for them and provide it. So um, I was glad that I had put a little bit of work in to, to do those. Uh, another thing that I'd seen a lot on those webinars was people talking about uh, puzzles that they were offering to people at home. So uh, I thought that seemed like a fairly easy thing that we could do. Um, I just did a Google search for the something that was free and easy. Um, chose I'm a puzzle .com and uh, was able to upload some of our photos to offer um, puzzles to people a couple of days a week. And they've seemed to really like them. I've been tracking them through um, just shortened links to see how many clicks we get. And we get um, we got up to 300 on over, over 300 on one of them. It was very popular. We're getting about 100, 150 on, on each of the the links. And uh, bonus here, I had my my son work on the uh one of the puzzles and kept him busy for about 20 minutes and he only tried to throw the ipad one or two times when he got frustrated so that was a, a good way to keep him busy uh, my boss had said that he um wanted some slightly easier ones for his grandkids so i released these um, same puzzles in nine and twelve piece so that younger kids could more easily do that um, and we had people that said they would definitely buy a real puzzle. So that's something that we'll look into in the future. I think we can make some um, pretty cool puzzles after, after all of this. Um, another thing I've relied a lot on is I use the Time Hop app personally. Uh, and since I take so many pictures myself um, at work every day, uh, I started looking through Time Hop to see if there was anything that I had taken pictures of in the past that I could reuse or use. Um, like this one popped up the other day. It was a, had been a donation from a donor that she had wanted me to send her a picture after she gave it. Um, so I took a picture and, and sent it over to her. Well, I realized I never did anything with this picture. I didn't share it or send it to the paper. So I'm gonna go back and pull it and I've got the caption there and I'll be able to easily use this one um, for the paper. Another one was I had chosen this gentleman to be our who was it Wednesday, but um, was kind of upset with myself that I didn't have a picture of his case anywhere. Um, and I said, well, I don't think I could get into the museum to get a picture. And the next day it popped up on my time hop that I'd forgotten I'd taken a picture five years ago when we replaced the lights in his case. Um, so I was able to more easily put together a profile and a um, information about him because when I zoomed in on here, I could read all the text and had my information that I needed for him as well. Um, they've kind of dipped their toes into doing virtual programming. Um, we had our first one last week. Um, as a virtual slideshow where we um, 
just let the attendees talk. I was really nervous about that, but it went well. Um, we had at one point about 60 people on the call um, and we just did it through Zoom. Um, and I just put together a PowerPoint slideshow of pictures, uh, about 15 pictures from uh, around Springfield. And I let them talk, um, gave us a lot of great information that we didn't already have. We recorded it. Um, they cleared up some things, gave us some um, new information. People found each other on it. It was, it was a lot of, it was really neat. Um, and my uh, boss has said, you know, he would really like us to continue uh, doing that in the future. So we decided to make it a biweekly thing. So next Wednesday, we're going to do a um, Clark County history trivia night. So I'll be putting together some PowerPoint slides. And um, these are both, these are all by registration. So we have a little bit of control over, over it. Um, so um, we sent that out yesterday and I've already gotten about um, 20 registrations. So hopefully that will go well next week. Um, it's gotten us thinking about how we can adapt other programs um, virtually because we, we honestly don't know how long this will be. Um, since most of our volunteers are retirees, we, we're really hesitant to bring them back um, anytime soon. And um, we know that there's other things in the community that we might be able to do um, and adapt. Like uh, this is a class that I taught on genealogy that I could easily adapt for a virtual um, program that we did for our, the, the senior center who has since canceled all their classes. This is another class that we did for the C, uh, senior center of, on preservation, um, Virginia, Casey and I, and we know that we could very easily adapt that and, and share with people um, through Zoom. So that's things that we've discussed. Um, haven't, this is uh, something that I'm not sure yet how we're, we'll handle this, um, having big student groups in here doing projects, um, how we'll be able to do that moving forward. But um, as far as behind the scenes tours, um, these two here show pictures of people that came in when things were good, when they could see how things were set up in, in our collections areas and in the archives. Um, I think maybe something that we could do now is show them where we are, what we're working back towards, and, and maybe open up some boxes and show people stuff, and we could do that virtually. Um, this was an oral history program that we did right after, it let, this just last month in April, um, someone from the city had contacted about adapting their programs, their program that they were going to do live. Um, and if we could support it and be, um, because it was going to be all about oral histories that were eventually going to come to us. So we, we did a program there of um, kids interviewing their elders. And I, of course, offered my daughter to be one of the interview interviewers for that. Um, uh, one here that we haven't discussed yet, and I'm hoping we don't have to adapt it virtually, is our wizarding event program. Um, for those of you that, that love Harry Potter, um, it's, that program's my baby. and um, so I got to do things like write wizarding bios for people in our uh, real history and, and things like that. Um, it's been a very popular program the last two years. Um, it's supposed to be in October. We don't know where things will be then, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, that's about all I have, but I did want to share a piece that I got from a webinar I was on yesterday for, for QZM. It was the best piece of advice that I'd heard was, do not worry about what other people are doing, which is what kind of paralyzed me the first couple of weeks was thinking we're not doing enough, we should be doing more. And it made me really stressed out because, you know, I've got this furry coworker and I have two other um, smaller coworkers that um, like to burst into the room all the time and, and make it a little bit difficult to do work. Um, but they said, you know, everybody's coming from a different place. You may have different staff, you may have different resources, different funding. Um, just do the best that you can. And that's what we've been trying to do through this. And that's what I've always tried to do is with what we share and what we do. Um, but I'll leave you with this, this little pie here from one of my volunteers who dropped it on my porch the week after we closed because she usually brings pies in on Wednesdays and was sad that she wasn't going to see us. So um, that's all I have to share. And thank you. I'll Thank you, Natalie, for such a wonderful example of different things that we can do. But I really like your point of it's not necessarily what other people are doing. Like, do what you can, but don't worry about what anyone else is doing. Um, so up next, we have Steve. Um, so Steve, take it away. All right. Good morning, everybody. Hang on a second. Let me just get everything going here. Okay, 
So good morning and uh, welcome to a presentation that probably feels a lot more relevant now than it would have six or eight weeks ago. Uh, my name is Steve Amidon, and I'm the Manuscripts and Outreach Archivist for the Brown Popular Culture Library at Bowling Green State University. Um, so as part of the outreach half of my job, um, I get to give talks to university and outside groups, uh, conduct tours of our amazing collections, and run our social media account. So obviously it's that last part that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I did want to quickly mention that I'm, I'm I'm just thrilled to be here. It, it, you know, ALAO and SOA are doing uh, such amaz amazing work in Ohio, um, and it's great to be a part of that. And I want to especially thank the, the organizers uh, for inviting me and, and for doing all the hard work necessary to, to move this event online. Um, so this was originally going to be a much more interactive talk. Uh, social media is, after all, a group effort, um, but obviously that's not the case. Uh, so I want you to do something instead while I'm, I'm talking. Take a minute and write down the names of the social media platforms uh, that your library, archives, historical society are using. Um, if you know it, maybe also jot down how long you've been using them. Um, and just keep this in mind and keep it at hand as we go through the talk. So for more than a decade, uh, going back to the mid-2000s, uh, there's been kind of a singular approach to social media and libraries and archives. And it doesn't matter if you're public, academic, governmental, it, it, it crosses all the boundaries. Uh, like magpies, we're kind of drawn to the shiny things. I want to try them all. So every new thing that comes up, we're, we're on top of it. Um, and there's a certain amount of sense to that. Uh, we want to be where the people are, and we want to showcase our ability to quickly adapt and be on the cutting edge. Um, and, and obviously our, in, our uh, professional publications and bloggers are out there sort of egging us on. So, you know, Animal Crossing and TikTok and Snapchat and, of course, Second Life um, are, have all gotten their moment in the sun uh, with uh, library use. Um, this seems especially true in our current cultural moment. Um, our digital connections to our patrons uh, feel more important than ever. I, and I'm, I'm sure that more than a few of you have gotten uh, some increased interest in your social media work uh, from uh, your administrators and, and supervisors as of late. The thing is, there is a cycle to these things, and we've all seen it over and over again. Uh, an organization adopts a new platform with great fanfare. Sometimes you're lucky enough to get a press release and media coverage to go along with it. Uh, you devote staff time, and if you're lucky, even additional funds uh, to the new platform, As and the organization then work, does its best to make the most of it. Um, sometimes you bring on an intern or uh, assign a particular staffer to, to generate the content um, and steer the project. But then there comes the inevitable crash. Maybe the platform falls out of favor. Maybe that staffer discovers they can't master the platform and no one else wants to do it. Uh, maybe someone leaves without sharing the passwords. Uh, and, or maybe something else just takes precedent. I mean, we are libraries and archives. Other things are always coming up. Uh, so the account quickly becomes a ghost. Before anyone knows it, years have gone by. The account's still alive, though. Uh, eagerly advertising that author event that's coming up in April of four or five years ago. Uh, the page often still bears the organization's name and logo, and maybe it, it still links to your website as well, assuming that link isn't dead as well. So the single official presence your organization has on that platform is now a complete ghost town. And, and the, the pages I've, I've selected here, what, you know, a couple of them are, were really notable at the time, Hennepin, Hennepin County uh, in Minnesota was highly touted and written about for their MySpace page years ago. And this screenshot was taken a couple of days ago. Um, so that page still exists out there. Uh, the New York Public Library, uh, their Tumblr page uh, was, was revered for a long time. Um, and the last post on there uh, is from more than two years ago. Uh, and it's promoting something on another platform that they've also stopped doing. 
Um, so, so there's a lot of these pages out there, um, whether we whether we remember it or not. Um, I can speak from some experience on this uh, because when I arrived at the Brown Popular Culture Library, we had no fewer than eight accounts on various social media and blogging platforms. All had been adopted with the best of intentions, um, but our our small staff of four people didn't have time to maintain them. Many of them were were just neglected. They would occasionally get resurrected when an intern or a student worker would arrive with new ideas and then just get abandoned again for a while when that person left. Now, I manage two social media accounts. Uh, we have an Instagram account that has around 500 followers, which is, meh, it's fine, it could be better. Um, and our Twitter account, which has become moderately successful, has more than 3,000 followers. Uh, we did, we, the most recent one, platform we eliminated was our Facebook page, uh, which we got rid of last year. Um, we do still contribute to the University Library's Facebook page uh, every once in a while. Uh, the other five accounts you see here, Flickr, WordPress, uh, Pinterest, Tumblr, and uh, our presence on the University Library's YouTube account have all been either put into hibernation or deleted entirely. So what caused this kind of drastic change? So part of it was a directive from the university that every unit on campus had to clean up their social media presence. Uh, for us, the, the decision making was actually pretty easy. Uh, the content we had on those platforms that, that we weren't using anymore, Pinterest, Tumblr, Flickr, WordPress, and, and the videos we had posted on the YouTube account uh, for university libraries, we, it was all dated um, and had received little, if any, engagement. Some of it was even ported over from other platforms, so there were a lot of dead links um, and things that didn't work anymore. Uh, these accounts have been created primarily just to have a presence, to, to do a thing on that platform without any real sort of strategy or vision for why. Uh, there was also a matter of, of resources. I, as the one now charged with the social media did not have time to uh, tend to and create content for eight different accounts. Uh, and we also didn't have the budget to do things like Facebook ads or targeted, um, targeted advertisements on other platforms to grow our audience. <clears throat> so as I, as I started to look around at the social media landscape for libraries, um, and I saw all these ghost pages, and I thought about all that wasted time and effort I tried to think of maybe if there's a new way that we can approach the adoption of these new platforms differently um, and, and more thoughtfully than we had been, especially now that we're in this period of great uncertainty and, and budget cuts and all of these other things. Um, I think there are four things that, that we can look at as essential to consider before we even open a social media account. First, we need to understand the existing audience on the platform. Second, we need to make sure that the contact, content that we can produce matches that platform. Third, uh, I think it's essential that we define what success is going to look like in advance before we've even started. Um, and fourth, and this is a really important point, but I rarely he hear people talking about it, is having an exit plan ready from day one, from the very beginning. So, when it comes to understanding the audience, I think there are three key questions that we need to ask. First, who is the audience? Who's already a member of that platform? Is it for kids? Is it young professionals, budding genealogists, uh, political nerds? Uh, what is it? Um, and, and once we understand that, and, and we can understand that by spending some time on that platform ourselves, um, once we establish that, it's important that we identify if that's an audience we need to reach. Uh, for example, a genealogical society needs TikTok as much as a teen librarian might need Facebook. Um, the, you know, there, there's a real mismatch there between the who needs to see the content and the platform itself. And then finally, I think that you need to stop and think about whether you reach the exact same audience via another platform. Um, especially now, we should not be making more work for ourselves if it's not gonna lead to a positive gain. Um, one more thing I, I wanted to point out in this segment 
is that libraries need to be careful about getting out of our lanes. Um, I think I'm thinking specifically of, of platforms like Snapchat and TikTok, um, but it can apply to any of them. You know, these the two platforms and Snapchat, Snapchat and TikTok are primarily for entertainment and for teens and younger folks. If you as an institution try to play it too cool or you try to be too hip, um, it can backfire spectacularly and you just, you've wasted all of your time and effort. So make sure you establish your institutional voice uh, before you start the account and then you stick to it. Uh, you know, at a pop culture library, we can be a little more irreverent, a little more off the cuff because that's pop culture, that's what we do. Um, but if you're a county historical society, you should be careful about that and really think through the audiences that are going to hear your, your, that are going to see your content. <laughs> so every social media platform has its own specialties and quirks, and it's really helpful to understand them up front. Uh, since we don't have a huge amount of time, I've pulled a few examples uh, just to give you an idea of some things to look for. So starting with Twitter, uh, Twitter's best feature is also one of the things that makes it really hard for institutions to be successful. It's fast. There are tens of millions of users, and even though the platform's algorithms can control what you see, you still miss dozens of posts every minute. Um, it's a really terrific platform for posting topical and relevant content. Um, you know, for example, we might uh, celebrate an anniversary of a TV show or, um, you know, mark the, the passing of, of a celebrity, and, and we can do that instantly without having to sort of schedule things and, and have some faith that people are actually going to see our content because they're looking for that TV show or that celebrity. Um, it's also, it's a platform built on community, which is really important. Being a passive user isn't enough. You have to engage with posts that are your own and you have to become part of the larger, larger conversation. Otherwise people will just see you as a spammer or just not worth following. If you're just cross posting your Facebook posts to Twitter, you're, you're just working against yourself in the end. Uh, so YouTube, we often think of as sort of a secondary social network. So we post our videos there. We uh, can take advantage of things like auto captioning, which for us public institutions is really important um, that, so that we're compliant and accessible. Um, and then we can link to them from blogs or social media posts elsewhere. Um, but it's also a place where you can build your own audience. So YouTube is filled with um, interesting things. People are often looking for, they call it satisfying content. Um, so there's behind the scenes videos, there's how to videos um, and, and spotlights on certain topics that, that people really get into. And right now, a lot of parents are using content from YouTube to augment their kids' lessons. So there's a real opportunity. However, it is really tricky to build an audience on YouTube. The platform's algorithm rewards constant updates and long videos, so over 15 minutes, um, as well as metrics like how many people subscribe to the channel and how many people like individual videos. So if you're not adding to it all the time, you're not going to build an audience there but you can certainly still use that content on other platforms. Um, so Instagram is almost an entirely visual platform. So it's got to focus on videos and, and photos. Uh, it's a good way, especially for archives and special collections uh, to share unique and visually interesting materials. Um, and followers are, are as important here as they are elsewhere but the use of hashtags can also allow your posts to be seen by a much broader audience. Unfortunately, again, for special collections and archives, uh, links aren't allowed in posts until you reach a certain size, uh, a certain number of followers as an account. So it can be difficult to do things like connect an image with a catalog entry. So that's a really tricky problem. It's also trend driven. So your content has to be relevant and it has to be something, again, going back to the hashtags, has to be something people are looking for in order to stand out. Nostalgia items uh, do really well on Instagram and just sort of quirky, weird things uh, do well, especially in the short video format. Um, Facebook is 
obviously the, the elephant in any social media conversation. It's a massive platform that allows for posting all kinds of content from images to videos to GIFs and a whole other a lot of things. Um, it has this built-in event calendar and fundraising tool that a lot of us have started to use uh, because we can't do it ourselves. Uh, however, it's a really tricky platform. So I mentioned that we deleted our Facebook page. Uh, we had, at the time we deleted, we had almost exactly 400 people who had liked our page, but we found that it was the same 10 or 15 people engaging with every single post. And it was really difficult to figure out if that was because our content wasn't good, maybe it was boring, I don't know, um, or if it was because the algorithms within Facebook were trying to force us to pay more to reach all our followers through targeted ads um, and other items. Maybe it was a little bit of both, I'm not sure. But it can be really tricky to use um, and a lot of places end up using it more just to post their hours and post events. Um, constant posting isn't rewarded as much as it is on other platforms. So I think the next step is we have to define success in advance. So we try to figure out how we're, how we're going to define success on this platform. Um, now that you've determined the audience, what are you trying to reach them for? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, as, as we just saw, different platforms are good for different tasks. Some might be good for one or two things. As you can see here, you know, Facebook and YouTube and Twitter can all be used for multiple different things. Um, while others are, are very specific. So TikTok and Snapchat have very specific uh, audiences and abilities um, that are difficult for a library or archive to take advantage of. Um, it's helpful here when you're trying to determine what you want to accomplish to be as specific and measurable as you can. So for example, you know, let's say we want to increase our event attendance by 25%. This is a number you're already tracking. You know, you're already tracking how many people attend each event. Um, and as you continue to track that, you can match it against uh, the amount of time you're, you're using the platform to promote the event and then uh, go from there. And that kind of brings me to, to metrics in general. Um, every platform has some kind, kind of metrics dashboard now, and a large percentage of it is just complete gobbledygook. Um, while there are metrics that can show you whether an individual post was shared and, and liked a good amount of time, a lot of the metrics that you'll find are, are sort of what they call vanity metrics. Uh, which basically exists to make you feel good about your continued use of the platform. So on Facebook, it's views. On Twitter, it's impressions. And these both essentially mean that your post appeared on someone's screen. It doesn't mean they engage with it in any meaningful way. So it's not exactly helpful. So instead, I'd recommend using more measurable things, like increased foot traffic, clicks to your website, reference requests, fundraising improvements, especially for most smaller libraries and archives, these are numbers you're already tracking, and so you can easily observe over time whether they change. Uh, one, of, one of the ways I think we can avoid becoming ghost accounts um, is to create a timeline and stick to it. So now that you've picked your metrics, you've identified your audience, uh, you can give yourself a set period of time, a year or six months, whatever works best you know, a fiscal year, whatever works best for your institution to see if the new platform has an impact. If that platform doesn't seem to be working out, if you're not seeing huge increases, you know, consider making some changes to your strategy, trying different approaches and posts, and then giving it another six months. Um, the point here is to work methodically, but quickly. So you're trying to work in, in manageable chunks uh, and understand that all of these platforms have a, have a real cost, uh, even if they're free on the surface. Um, our time and money in, in libraries is not infinite. Uh, so we have, so setting a realistic time frame can, can give you uh, a, a savings in time and money. You, you give yourself a certain amount of time to create your content and you minimize the amount of, of money you're spending uh, on things like staff salaries dedicated to social media and audience reach. The last and most important way to define success is to identify who's going to do the work. 
Uh, if you're a loan arranger or a social media staff of one, congratulations, you are the one. Um, but I want to emphasize for those folks that your time is precious and, and you shouldn't be using platforms you're not comfortable with. Um, so ways to do to get more comfortable is to use it yourself personally. Um, also spend time reading and, and understanding the content on the platform. I always tell people read more than you post. Um, look at what other institutions like yours are doing. Uh, understand that uh, the things that they're having success with and what they're not uh, successful with. If you're lucky enough to have a social media capable staff, you can start by talking with those who might already use the platform. Um, their understanding of the community and especially the tone and voice of the platform can be a secret to success. <clears throat> but be aware that uh, Oops, sorry, uh, be aware that those folks may not have the time, the extra time within their already busy schedule to do this work, or their approach to the platform may be very different from that institutional voice that we talked about earlier. Um, so you, you just need to keep that in mind as you go. Um, so the, the final thing and, and the most important part of this whole process, I think, is planning for the day when it's time to turn off the account. This might seem kind of defeatist, but it will save you from lots of headaches in the end. Uh, first, you need to identify who determines when you're done. So if you and your board of trustees sit down at that six month mark um, or your boss sit down at that six month mark to look at your, your existing time frame uh, that you've given yourself for success, that's a good natural decision point. Um, and, and you can kind of identify who the important uh, folks are to have in that room. Um, in addition to your metrics uh, that we, we've already discussed, uh, consider whether the staff tasked with running the account still enjoys doing it. Um, the level of enthusiasm of the people posting content can show on the platform and it can really, it, it should really be a, a major consideration as you're deciding whether you want to continue. And you should also talk with your stakeholders. So if you delete your platform tomorrow, will your stakeholders actually care? Uh, this is what we found with our Facebook account, that most of those who engaged with us there were following us elsewhere as well. So they didn't really notice uh, or, or have any strong feelings about whether our Facebook page went around or went away. So once you've decided it's time, um, you need to identify your approach. So there are two options that I think are, are worth looking at. The first is to stop posting but retain the page. Um, this is especially useful if you have a lot of followers, but you've just reached a point where you can't support the page anymore. Um, so you, you give your followers warning, say, you know, after this date, we're not going to update this page. And then your last post should be a static post indicating that the page isn't being updated and give other people give people other ways to connect. Um, a few things behind the scenes that are really important in this case um, are to make sure that the username and password information is kept and updated as necessary um, because the account uh, can still be hacked. Um, uh, dormant accounts, especially on, on platforms like Twitter, uh, are, are, are frequent targets of, of hackers and spam bots. And you also will want to make sure that you have uh, two-factor two authentication enabled. You should have that already, but this is especially a, a good time uh, to enact that. Um, and then you also want to go back every once in a while to make sure that nothing's gone wrong, make sure that people aren't spamming your account in some way. Um, so it's sort of, uh, is, it, it's free like a puppy. Think of it that way. Um, you know, it's a solution, but it's it's one where you have to you have to keep managing it. The other option is to delete your page entirely. Uh, in this case, you again want to give ample warning to your followers. Uh, with our Facebook page, we did two weeks, and we found that worked really well. Um, again, with posts that include the information about where else they can find you, um, you'll also want to research the platform's deletion process. Um, all of them are a little bit different, and they all want to retain you as a user. I'll talk about this in a second. Um, talk more about that in a second. Uh, where it's possible, you want to download all of the data you can from the platform. Um, this is uh, this is doable on on platforms like Twitter and Facebook. 
um, and there are uh, videos and, and web pages online you can use to, to do that. Um, this will give you a record of the posts and media uh, that appeared on there just in case you need to refer back to them for some reason or you want to reuse that content elsewhere. Uh, then you want to pull the plug and it's, it's time to uh, delete, the, delete the platform, um, go through the process, uh, and then again, you need to make sure that you're going back occasionally to, make, to check for uh, possible impersonators, squatters, people that uh, may be trying to pretend they are you on that platform. Um, I mentioned the shutdown process and I wanted to share my experience with, with three of the ones that we've done. Uh, Facebook, Tumblr, and Pinterest, because they're they're good uh, indicators of, of how uh, finicky these processes can be. Um, Facebook pages can only be deleted by the page owner, which is a good reason to keep very good records of what email account the Facebook account is tied to, uh, because if you lose that, you're going to have some issues. Uh, you can download all the data from your page. It takes a while, and it's usually a pretty big file. Um, once you go through the deletion process, your page switches to unpublished mode for two weeks, which means it's not visible, but it still exists. Um, it's worthwhile going back after two weeks to uh, make sure that the page actually does uh, go away. Um, Tumblr is more of a slash and burn approach. You can't download your data, and assuming you only have one uh, page active on Tumblr, the only way to remove that page from view is to delete the entire account. So be ready for that uh, when you go through the process. Um, Pinterest I found to be particularly tricky. You can delete the page, but as soon as you log back into Pinterest, it automatically resurre resurrects the page. And when they send you that email confirming that you deleted it, the biggest link there is to log back in. So it, it, they're trying to get you back in um, in any way they possibly can. As I said, these are all a little different and each is tricky in its own way. So make sure you do your research. I wanted to share this worksheet um, and just as a useful exercise to get down on paper everything you know and don't know about your social media accounts. So the platform name, how long you used it, who the audience is, and what you use it for. I think doing this every once in a while, even if you're not just starting your account, is really helpful to, to really think about um, what you're doing in terms of social media. Um, I'm including a couple of links here uh, to really interesting resources. Uh, the first is by Adam Kazari uh, when he was at the Museum of English Rural Life. Uh, and it goes through the uh, planning and aftermath of a, a very popular post that the Merle made um, back in 2018. And I recommend uh, following their accounts uh, to understand what they do that's a little bit different. Um, but it's really helpful in terms of understanding strategy and ways to go about things um, that maybe are a little bit different than you've engaged with before. And then the other one is uh, an article I found uh, recently on Public Libraries Online that goes into a lot of the, the stuff that I've already talked about here, but in a little more detail. So it's, it's worth looking at. I will say that uh, you should always be wary of articles about social media. Um, Many of them are completely out of date by the time they're published. Um, if it doesn't have a byline of the year you are in, it's, it's worth um, taking it with a grain of salt. Um, so that's it for me. Um, I'm happy to talk to folks afterwards. Uh, feel free to email me uh, or find me on Twitter or Facebook, um, and I'm glad to chat. Uh, thanks again to the organizers for having me, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Steve. Um, I know that I certainly learned a lot from your talk. Um, with that being said, uh, we are approximately halfway through the webinar. We're going to take a quick five minute break, um, but we will resume at 11.14. Um, please continue to drop questions on the Padlet or in the chat. Um, and if you have any questions um, for someone who is hosting, uh, please let either me, Suzanne Reller, or Stephanie Brooking know. All right, everyone, welcome back to our outreach webinar. 
Um, up next, we have Jennifer and Jen. So please take it away, y'all. All right. Well, hello. Um, my name is Jen Haney. You'll also hear from Jennifer Baker. Uh, I am the Director of Records Management and Archives here at Warren County. And today we're going to talk a little bit about oral histories, uh, kind of a case study of what we did here at Warren County um, to uh, try to get our oral history program going. Um, and it, you see our title, um, let's try this again, Revamping Oral History at Warren County. Uh, Jennifer will give you a lot more to title this uh, with our ups and downs of trying to get this program going. So uh, with uh, no further, um, a little bit of background about myself. Um, again, like I said, I'm the Director of Records Management here at Warren County. Uh, as I previously mentioned, I have been here for seven years. Uh, before working at Warren County, I worked at the AFL History Office at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as a processing archivist. Uh, at the Green County Room at the Green County Library. And then I spent a couple years working at the University of Dayton in their circulation uh, department. Uh, when I got here, in uh, 2013, uh, we um, did not have much of a outreach at all. Um, we are, uh, can you guys see my screen? Uh, hold on. We can't currently see your screen. Oh, okay, sorry about that. I must not have shared my screen. <laughs> Go figure. All right, give me just one second. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. All right. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for letting me know. Um, all right, so um, just a little bit background about uh, the Record Center. Our staff members, um, our mission is to serve the public through the protection and access to public records and document the activities and functions of Warren County. And we have a relatively large um, record storage area. Again, uh, when I got to Warren County, um, we did not have much of a presence online period. Um, with this slide, you'll see that uh, this was our website. Uh, the website started in 2001, and this was the website that we had when I started in 2013. Um, and this was basically it. There was an email from uh, or an area that you can make a records request, but beforehand we did not have any kind of social media. Um, we didn't really have a basic inventory of uh, how to uh, find our, um, uh, our, our records. And uh, we really, um, didn't have much presence except for patrons could come in, they could make web requests, or they could give us a call. Uh, so when I started, uh, I wanted to change that. Um, I have, uh, being that pretty much every position I've ever had has been very public focused, um, and that's what we are. We are a public institution. I wanted to up an uptick in our public access and outreach. So the first thing I did uh, was updated our website. And then I began an overhaul of our inventory and indexing of records. Um, that year and the next couple years, we had interns that would come in and they would session our records um, and then also put them in Excel databases. Um, so we had a better idea of where they were, but eventually we could also get those uh, records online so that uh, individuals could start researching them. Then in 2015, I hired an intern who you'll see here, 
uh, Shelby Dixon Baby. She had, um, prior to uh, being our intern, she had worked um, with some social media and also had worked um, with uh, outreach, um, educational outreach. And um, we had hired her to do the launch our Facebook page and WordPress and uh, also write uh, with um, with some guidance from myself and our prosecutor's office, a social media policy, so that we could launch our Facebook and WordPress. Um, and then also uh, she worked on our educational outreach program, which Jennifer now runs and worked on um, uh, exhibit with our infirmary building. Fast forward to 2017, um, something that I had been wanting to start doing for a while, um, was an oral history program. Um, I had actually seen some videos um, from Looking County, uh, which they had done a county home oral history project back in 2012, 13, and 14. Uh, and I thought these were wonderful. Um, they, had, uh, they had videos, they also had sometimes uh, just recording, audio recordings of um, individuals that they had interviewed uh, that had spent time um, living at their old county home. And I wanted something similar at Warren County just because we had so many people that had been, um, as we've been doing different exhibits, reach out to us saying that they have stories to share about living, uh, li living at the county home. Uh, they remember uh, going to the old infirmary building. Um, they remember or having field trips at the uh, old county jail. Um, and so when, when, once I started looking at Licking County stuff, I kind of got a little jealous and decided to do some research um, and see if this was something that we could even do. Um, and as one of my slides, or as what, what I have on there says, imitation is the best form of flattery, uh, I kind of uh, uh, decided that um, I, I kind of liked what Licking County had, had done. So I stole some of their ideas and uh, um, then went on, found some best practices from uh, the, the Smithsonian uh, and some other universities about how they um, do their oral histories. Uh, we put together an oral history release form. And then I basically told Jennifer to go be awesome. Um, I have a tendency to have ideas and then have this, let the staff uh, kind of go with them, go with it. So uh, I will go ahead and let Jennifer uh, take the screen. So as Jen said, I am in charge of Warren County Record Center and Archives Outreach Program. Uh, and with most of our projects, uh, the way that it works is Jen comes up with brilliant ideas and then she tells me to go be awesome. So <laughs> these are some pictures of some of the projects we've worked on. Um, for our oral history program, Jen kind of went over some of the origin story of that. Um, for me, my understanding was that we were gonna be interviewing, or the idea was to interview employees and retirees, mostly. Um, you know, when I started in 2015, we were just getting started on all of our outreach. So, even though the oral histories were mentioned, it was just not something that we prioritized at the time. We were getting our Facebook page and our blog up first so that we could really get our face and name out there. And then we followed that up with the education outreach program, which is something that I do primarily, which takes a lot of my time. So, um, you know, in the beginning of our outreach, it just was not a priority for us. So when we were researching our historic jail and sheriff's res residence is when the opportunity really kind of presented itself to make this a priority for us to get done. So, um, you know, we got to work figuring out the logistics of 
at creating an oral history. This is not something that I had any experience doing. We had went over it a little bit during my program at Wright State, but it is not something that they focus on either. So my training was very limited. Um, but luckily, if you go online, it is really easy to find a lot of free resources that will help you set up your program. So make sure, as Jen said, that you're not reinventing the wheel. So um, she mentioned the Smithsonian uh, that we use their resources. They have a folk life and oral history interviewing guideline. That is what we use to set up our questions. So the base questions that we ask people. Um, so while we were researching our um, exhibit on the sheriff's residence, we very quickly put together policies, um, waivers, and questions. And then we followed that up with um, answering all the how, when, and where information. So you know, you need to know how you're going to conduct your interviews, um, what method you're going to use. For us, in our first interview in the summer of 2017, we had an audio recorder that we thought would work best. So that's what we decided to go with. Uh, the when and where information, we prefer to do these at our location because we can control the environment. Um, so, you know, we we give people the option or we gave them the option to set it up at our building or they we could meet them where they were at. Um, and then, like I said, don't reinvent the wheel. So make sure you're going out and searching resources, which we have a list that we can share with you at the end. So once we figured out the logistics of that first interview, and this was a fast process, our big um, case that we change out everywhere that you can see in the, or that we change out um, every other summer, um, you can see it here. We do that with our interns starting in May and we have it open uh, by August. So all of this usually takes place in the summer. Um, so our first interview, um, was with Miriam and Vance Satterthwaite. So we conducted this interview on July 26th, 2017. Um, they were one of the last families who lived in our sheriff's residence. So it was vital to get an interview with them while we were researching our exhibit. Um, so they their story tied into what we were already researching because Miriam, was the wife of the current or the sheriff in the early 1960s, but she was also the jail matron. And then Vance Satterthwaite is their son. So he lived in the sheriff's residence as a child. So their story clearly tied into what we were trying to research already. Um, now there was a sense of urgency while we were uh, preparing to interview them because Miriam is was in her early 90s, I believe, at the time. So, you know, with an aging population, especially with the buildings in Warren County, most of them closed in the mid-1960s. So if anybody has experience in those buildings, they're going to be part of that population. So we want to make sure that we were getting this story as quickly as possible. Also, like I said, we were trying to get it before our exhibit opened in August. Uh, just talking to people, especially when you're doing multiple interviews, or I'm sorry, interviews with multiple people, there were multiple scheduling conflicts throughout the, the process of getting this first interview set up. And then the interview, because we did not have much experience or maybe we could have researched better, ended up being two hours, 13 minutes and 54 seconds, which is excessive especially if you're expecting other people to um, listen or watch these interviews. And then the last thing about this interview was that we used our audio recorder. So we only had audio of this interview. And since we live in such a visual environment right now, especially if you want to share any of your information, only having audio is just not ideal. So. So that's how our first interview went. And 
So flash are going forward, our next interviews weren't until the summer of 2019. So we went almost two years before we had another interview. And I went back and reviewed some of the places where we got stuck in this process. So we got, we had an idea, got really excited, implemented it, and then we kind of just fell off the cliff and, you know, didn't conduct another interview for quite a while. So some of the ways that we got stuck and weren't able to move forward is that we made assumptions that the people in the community would want to participate. So we put up a flyer, you know, calling the community to action saying, hey, if you want to share your story, we were assuming that they were as excited about this program that they probably didn't even know about as we were. Uh, so lack of follow up, we also did not post about the interview that we had conducted. So I'm not really sure how I thought we would get excitement generated. So make sure that you're posting about it. And then prioritization. Once fall hit, I went back to um, doing those education outreach programs and that took up most of my time. So it just was not a priority for me and it wasn't a priority for the record center. And then lastly, lack of confidence. Um, it's really hard to reach out to people and be rejected. So you kind of have to build a thick skin when you're asking people to share their stories with you. So those were some of the areas where I, I believe we, you know, kind of failed temporarily. So how we overcame all of those obstacles. So starting in the summer of 2019, we were researching our children's home. And we already knew that this, um, we didn't have a lot of personal stories and we did not know a lot about the daily operations or how the children were kept or how they behaved while staying there. So we wanted to get some personal stories to help us tell the history of the building itself. So some of the ways that we were able to do that. So do not hesitate to reach out directly to people if you have some contact information. So if you have a phone number, an email, or even Facebook, don't hesitate to reach out to people. One of the things that I did was I went on to some of the other local Facebook pages that had posted about our children's home. And I actually just um, read through all the comments that were on that post because it's public. If those people were confident enough to post about their experience at the children's home, I reached out directly to them. So I would send them direct messages or if they had included their email address, I sent them emails directly, letting them know what we were doing, what the program was, what sort of information we were hoping to gain from this, and then a contact so that they could follow up. Also, we made sure to post about this regularly on our Facebook page. Um, as you can see here, this is an example of one of the posters that we created asking for people's stories because we wanted to make sure that they knew that their story is valuable. And we let them know that we were reaching out, not just for the um, children's home, but anyone who had spent time in any of our county buildings or anybody who had worked for the county that might no longer. So anything that would add value to the Warren County government history. Uh, word of mouth. One of my coworkers who is now spearheading this program, she's lived in Warren County her whole life. So she knows a whole bunch of people. So if you know someone who knows someone who knows someone, make sure that you write those names down and document that information and get a contact, uh, get contact information. Also, I talk about our program to every person that I encounter when they ask about what we are working on so that they know we are searching for these stories to help add to our uh, oral histories. So making sure that you're promoting it by word of mouth with various people that you're talking to. Uh, also, all of our exhibits now have flyers that advertise our program and then we uh, usually have a poster with our exhibits that includes um, information as well about how people can share their stories with us. And then finally, just be insistent and consistent. So making sure that you're um, insistent, especially letting people know that their story is valuable and consistently following up with those people. Okay, some lessons that we are learning, and I say this because I continue to make some of these mistakes 
as I'm interviewing people. So first of all, I get very nervous. So calming down, make sure you take a deep breath. It's very exciting to get someone to confirm that they're going to share their story with you, but you have to make sure that you're prepared to accept that story and do all the proper steps. So for me, that's the biggest thing. Secondly, take pictures. The first interview that we did, I didn't even share it on our Facebook page because it was such long audio and I didn't have a picture of that experience to accompany it. So make sure you take pictures. And I put that because I continue to forget because I get so excited. So make sure you take pictures. Be flexible. You know, if you're trying to meet these people on their time, sometimes you do have to be flexible. And sometimes we've offered our time outside of work um, in order to make these interviews happen. Uh, research. So make sure you're researching the topic that you're wanting to interview someone about, but also researching that person if you can. So making sure you know stuff about them before you interview them. That way you can tailor the topics that you want to discuss. Uh, stay on topic. That's a big one because if you don't stay on top of uh, your interview, people will continue talking and maybe sometimes that information isn't valuable to the story you're trying to tell. Uh, prepare for deviations. As I said, people will continue to elaborate. Um, and then be sensitive. Like I said, the first person that we interviewed was in her mid 90s. So your questions need to be sensitive to the generation that you're talking to. So you want to make sure that you're sensitive to them. Also, when people were put into the children's home, that's a sensitive topic in itself. So you don't want to hit on you know, any topics that are going to upset them. Um, keep it PC. We're a local county government. We're not trying to dig up dirt about the community. We just want people to share their stories. So um, we had a prosecutor's uh, employee that was retiring that was very worried about sharing her story because I think she thought we were looking for more information than what we were. Uh, have a disclaimer. We had a local lawyer uh, that we interviewed about a really famous case in Warren County. Um, and he was a very colorful figure. So we wanted to make sure that if people were watching that, they knew that the opinions or the discussion wasn't necessarily reflective of what our uh, policies were. And then finally, follow up with people. You know, make sure that when you're trying to schedule your interviews, that you're following up with people so that they understand the value of what they have to say. Um, but then also following up after the interview so they know how appreciative you are of their story and they might be willing to um, to then reach out to other people that they think might be able to add to um, our oral history experience. And then this is an example of one of the posters that we created um, after we had done some oral histories on the children's home. So we made sure to share some quotes from those that helped tell the story of the building. And then finally, um, because of all those things, we were able to successfully interview all of these wonderful individuals. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it back to Jen because I think I talked a little too long, so. <laughs> all right. Um, so to follow up, with uh, uh, Jennifer, um, and uh, I can um, share our YouTube page um, in the chat box so you guys can all check 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 these out. Uh, one of the things once we had done started doing a lot of the interviews um, that I um, I will take responsibility for is um, we hadn't really done much with transcriptions. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, this is great to have the stuff online and available to the public. But people um, also, just because we want to be AD, want to read some of the stuff, even if they're a two hour long interview, um, people are interested in reading um, what they've talked about. Um, but it's something that um, we, we would get to when we get, get to it. Um, some of, YouTube does have um, transcription um, software that goes with their stuff, but it's not great. You don't also get some of those little added things that you write in your notes, of course, um, when you're doing the interviews. And um, it's not always accurate. 
transcript. Um, we also have uh, the recorder device that we use as well has transcription software, but it's the same thing. Um, so for six weeks, um, most of my staff, all of my staff actually had been out. So um, I had put all of our um, interviews um, in one drive. So at some point, maybe some of the staff members could um, do transcription. They had time because they were all going to be working from home. Well, lo and behold, we realized that um, one of our staff members who doesn't do anything with outreach is actually a is awesome at uh, doing transcription. So that's what he's been doing. And this is a um, one of the um, interviews that we have. One of our favorite interviews that the girls did, um, Clyde Baskin, um, and some of his transcription. Um, so when I had started doing this presentation, um, I had a whole different idea of what we were going to be doing toward, or what I was going to be talking about at the end, but then COVID happened. So I decided that maybe I take the approach of what happens now that we are in a post-COVID um, uh, times. Um, and something that I've been doing a little bit of research in um, is how do, we, how do we advance this moving forward? Um, you'll see that I have a couple different apps. Obviously, right now we're using Zoom. Um, there's other apps and other technologies we can, you can utilize, WebEx, GoToMeeting, uh, Google Duo, and Hangouts, um, if you have access to that, and then also Microsoft uh, Teams. Um, all of these have capabilities of being able to have um, an individual's um, and yourself be recorded, or you could just record them um, with your audio. Um, the problem with a lot of these is that if you don't already have Teams or Google Hangouts, um, they, after a free trial, with, especially with Zoom, WebEx, GoToMeeting, a lot of times there's a cost um, involved. So that's something you have to think about. Another thing is, is that especially with um, the demographic that we have, we're talking about individuals who are older, um, they may not be as tech savvy. How do you utilize these? with um, individuals who may not have that same type of, um, of technological experience. Um, and uh, moving forward, what we might end up having to do is uh, social distancing with masks and the old fashioned recording device. Uh, as Jennifer said, we do, have, um, we do have a recorder that we use with some of our um, interviewees because we give them the option of whether they want to be on camera or not uh, with, the, um, with the release that they sign. So, um, sorry, whoops. Uh, I wanna thank you guys uh, for letting us be a part of this and um, thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Thank you, Jennifer and Jen, so much. Um, just as a gentle reminder, because it looks like we have a good chance of going over um, our time for noon, um, we are recording this. So if you have to duck out right at noon or just before, um, please watch the recording um, for this wonderful talk coming up. Um, Miriam, please take it away. Thank you. Let me get my screen share going. Um, thanks all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this and really grateful to the organizers for, um, for um, making it happen online. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, so, um, My topic today is outreach in a time of overwhelm. How can we maintain or gain momentum? Um, and these are the learning objectives um, or the takeaways that I um, included with my proposal. Um, and I will say that um, this is not what I had originally proposed. My, my pre-pandemic topic was the librarian's guide to fearless cold calling or getting comfortable with uncomfortable outreach techniques. Um, that is still very, very relevant here, but I've shifted the focus a bit. The topic is still relevant because something that I've been feeling since this began and that I've heard from many colleagues from different institutions um, that they are also feeling and experiencing is not wanting to contact faculty or whoever your stakeholders, partners, and collaborators are. 
Nobody wants to bother anyone else or create more work for them or be insensitive to some of the other difficulties they may be contending with, whether it's illness, homeschooling children, job losses, or other losses. As with most things, what I've started to conclude and work through, and which I hope will come through over the course of this talk, is that all we can try to do is find a balance. Balance how much we contact people and what we say to or ask of them or offer them with the need and desire to keep doing our jobs and to keep doing them as well as circumstances allow. Um, also balancing realizing that our time and the difficulties we may be contending with are just as important to take into consideration as worrying about others. Basically, as we heard from Natalie earlier, do what you can and what is right for you and don't worry about what anyone else is doing. So one instance where my original topic coincides with what I'm talking about today is the idea of seizing the moment. Um, and by that, I do not mean seize this COVID moment, which sounds a bit uh, morbid. Um, what I do mean is that when any opportunity, even an uncertain or long shot one pops up during this time, but really any time, seize it and try to act on it. An example for me came via my capacity as liaison librarian to the University Honors Programs, which is another part of my job in addition to being responsible for the rare books. Um, for us with COVID, the shift to remote classes happened during spring break, and then spring break was extended an extra week. By then, there were only a few weeks left in the semester, which ended in late April. A week or so after spring break, the director of one of the honors programs sent an email about co-curricular and other engagement resources and experiences. These are required for her students to advance in their program. Totally spontaneously, without planning or really even thinking about it, I immediately responded with an idea that popped into my head when I read her email, which was to offer a virtual synchronous um, tour, so to speak, of our digital archives. The director was excited. She pulled her students about it, along with some other program offers that had been made. Students were interested, and so we went ahead and scheduled. At that point, I had less than a week to prepare to teach online, which was something I had never done before. Um, here's the program description. A one-hour session that will combine discussion of primary sources with a virtual guide through our digital archives. Participants will learn to define and identify primary source materials and will gain comfort and familiarity with searching, viewing, and downloading our digitized content. There will be time for individual exploration and Q&A as well. When my boss found out about it, she asked if it could be more widely promoted. The honors director agreed, and so we did just that, circulating the notice and posting it on the on online events calendar. Library student workers and other student employees in need of work to fill their time from home were also invited. In the end, I had 12 participants, which given the circumstances and the very short timeline was a number I was pretty happy with. It did include a few library colleagues. With so little time to create and prepare the session, I didn't have a lot of time to think about assessment, but since I had never taught online before and was using new to me tools like Answer Garden, I still wanted to have at least a brief survey, survey for participants to complete at the end. Eight completed the survey. During an in-person class, I would normally keep a few minutes at the end of a session for a survey like this to ensure maximum participation. As I think we all know, if you send out a survey after, response rates tend to be extremely low. So how to replicate that online? For a class and with the instructor's agreement, you could make completion of the survey a condition um, to demonstrate that students completed the session for attendance or participation points for the day. Since this was a more informal session with a mixed audience, I still left a few minutes at the end and I asked participants to complete the survey before logging off of the meeting. That way they didn't have to allot any additional time to complete it. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the results since we're low on time um, and since you might not be able to see the charts very well through the share screen. Um, but briefly, they were very um, positive um, and I just wanted to mention the questions that I did ask. Um, first, I asked if the session met, exceeded, or did not meet their expectations. Next, I included a series of statements to which they could respond, not at all, a little, neutral, some, or yes, absolute, absolutely. These were, this session improved my understanding of the digital archives. This session improved my understanding of primary sources. After this session, I am more likely to use digital archives materials. The presentation was clear and informative. The instructor made space for questions and discussion and I would recommend the session to other students or classes. 
I tried to write questions that reflected the learning objectives and that evaluated both the content and my own performance. Finally, I asked three write-in questions, which many of you will be familiar with. What is one new thing you learned, one question you still have, and one thing that could have been done better? Um, one thing I was interested in is that I received very similar comments to what I received during an in-person session, um, where the main criticism or suggestion is almost always for more time with the materials. Um, so overall, I felt that the session was successful. Um, probably the comment I was most excited about was somebody writing, um, I learned that I shouldn't be worried about using archives because they are there to be used. Even though I was introducing the students to digital archives, I talked about um, the archives being open and available to anyone and anyone being able to come in and access and use materials. Um, so having somebody remember that and have that as their takeaway um, was really important to me. The session as a whole was mostly useful for me to get a better understanding of what was possible in terms of remote outreach and instruction for archives and special collections. And this got me thinking about what I could do moving forward. The main thing I realized is that I had done a synchronous session and what is most useful to most people right now, including faculty and instructors and including most of us, is content available for asynchronous sessions and short instructional tutorial style videos perhaps a series of them rather than a single long video which students can get lost, confused, or just lose the thread and interest. So that's where I began, that's where I was when I began really thinking about this summer and especially the fall. Um, I had an interactive slide here which I took out because of time, but I hope that you'll all be thinking about a possible kind of seize the moment example which has recently come up for you or maybe one that you can create because you never know what it might turn into. My video tour is now part of another project that one of our assistant deans is sharing with various groups on campus. So taking a risk by responding to an email before I could talk myself out of it has led to something that is now taking on a bit of a life of its own. So now I'm focusing most of my time and attention on preparing for fall. And fall, um, for us at least, and perhaps for most of you, is still very up in the air, which has made planning difficult. At first, my strategy was to wait until we knew which of the three main scenarios would come to pass. So either we would reopen with classes on campus, but with restrictions, um, partial reopening with some classes and some students on campus, others online and still remote, or ongoing closure with all classes um, and students continuing remotely. But then when I started thinking about special collections and how we normally work, I realized that there was really no reason to wait. Probably this, these images, um, are what a lot of your normal instruction sessions also look like. Groups of students and instructors and visitors closely clustered around an item or set of items, talking, touching, pointing, taking notes, passing things around, asking questions, and so on. And what I came to realize in conversation with my colleagues in our special collections is that even if some or all students are back on campus in the fall, we will not work this way with people close to one another and touching all the materials. We're not yet sure how we will work, but the safest, easiest way to proceed was to assume that most of my fall instruction will take place remotely, regardless of where students and classes physically are. This realization helped me break the paralysis I had been in of not reaching out to faculty because I couldn't imagine what to say to them or how we might start planning. Um, and I hope we have time for that. Everyone um, can quickly go to slido.com um, to, to take a very quick poll. You can use your laptop or your phone or any other device and just go to slido.com, type in the code. Um, our code is 87537. You can also use your phone to um, scan the QR code, which should take you right there. Um, if it isn't working, let me know, or I'll know because no responses. It's working, okay. <laughs> uh, we'll just take a minute to see if people know what their fall is gonna look like since we do not yet know. Not yet determined is so far the winner. Yeah. Some of you have partial reopening. Okay. Um, so uncertainty is ruling the day for most of us. Um, that's reassuring to hear, um, even though I know it's very difficult. Um, so feel free to keep responding. I'm gonna keep going since we're low on time. I can get the slide to advance.
Okay. Um, so with this uncertainty, I was have been very overwhelmed and unsure of how to proceed um, in this new world. So I looked to my good friend and colleague Hannah Schmellen, who is our librarian for health sciences and one of the most organized, efficient, and productive librarians I know. She keeps this sort of matrix on her desk and refers to it constantly. Some time ago, I had her share a copy with me, with me because it's such a useful reference when you're trying to decide how to prioritize projects. And even before that, trying to decide which projects to accept um, and which to pass on or save for another time. Basically, it helps you weigh risk and reward by thinking about how much work a project will be and how much of an impact it will have. So something that is difficult and will likely have little impact, try to avoid doing it. If it's pretty easy and will have a big impact, start there and so on. So it's pretty basic, but for me, it really helps to have it laid out like this. Um, and I decided to adapt her matrix um, for the current situation just to help me get started. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, and this being able to do this was the second thing along with realizing that I should plan for a remote instruction for fall, no matter what, um, instead of waiting around for formal pronouncements from the university that really helped propel me forward um, and motivated me to figure out how I can still do my job basically without access to the physical materials um, and how to make the goals within my job still relevant and meaningful and to start conducting outreach again. Um, so basically, the place that I would start first is to match faculty and classes being offered in the fall um, that I've previously worked with. So where I already know the assignments, I kind of know what they're looking for and what they're doing, um, and see which ones of those I can match up with materials that we already have digitized. These are the people I'm contacting first, one at a time, individually, with course-specific and material-specific ideas, questions, and suggestions. Um, the next group of people that I'm contacting, um, but more selectively, are also faculty and classes I've worked with previously, but for whom we currently do not have any available digitized materials. Um, so then the conversation is, can we create a targeted digitization project this summer, perhaps? Or are there primary sources in the library's existing databases that we could work with? Are there digitized materials available via other institutions that we could use? Um, there's increasing usage of other people's materials during this time, and that's, that's something that's really exciting. Um, or can I brainstorm with a faculty member any other ways of proceeding? What I'm doing very minimally um, is sending out general emails with links to resources to faculty that just sort of say, I'm here, please contact me if and when you need support. Um, I think that's too vague, and with the overwhelm that I know I and so many other people are feeling, um, plus the flood of emails that everyone is getting, I think that kind of thing, at least in my experience, is getting a little bit lost and not getting a lot of responses to. And then what I'm not doing at all, and what I would normally be doing, is trying to identify faculty and classes um, that I've never worked with before. Um, at least for this fall, um, that is too difficult in terms of also matching them with materials. So that's on my don't do this list. Um, and the general emails thing is almost on my don't do this list either. I'm really working on the targeted, um, the much more targeted individualized emails. So um, we don't really have time, but I was hoping to do a brainstorm um, with you for all of your, um, what comes to mind for your highest impact slash easiest, most doable possible next step. Um, I'm not gonna um, do it right now, but I hope that you'll be thinking about that. And I hope that thinking about um, framing um, your next step in that way is as helpful for you, um, some of you, as it has been for me. So one thing that I think academic librarians are constantly asking ourselves, and I think this translate to, translates to any institution, and again, whoever your stakeholders and um, partners and collaborators are, um, what do they need from us and what do they want from us right now? Um, there's so much uncertainty that I feel like the question now is more fraught and more difficult to answer than ever. Um, but I finally sort of got beyond my um, desire to not bother anyone and realize that we will only know the answers if we ask. 
So if we reach out and they say, no, I can't think about doing this or collaborating right now, that tells us something. If we reach out and we get no response, that tells us something. They might also be thrilled that we asked. I've just started reaching out and everyone I've reached out to has said, they didn't wanna bother me, they don't wanna make more work for me, they don't wanna take up my time. These are exactly the same reasons that I was hesitant to reach out to them. So I tell them, this is my job, and this is the part of my job that I most want to be doing. And that's where the conversations begin. Some faculty are also looking for something new, something fun, something to help them fill their remote class time, uh, which is brand new to them as well, and not all their content is going to transfer. Some need help, some don't, some welcome fresh perspective, some don't. So really exactly the same as in normal circumstances but these are anything but normal circumstances. Everything is heightened and more charged. So taking the first step, for me at least, felt a lot scarier than usual until I just started doing it. I have a long list of faculty still to contact and I'm gonna keep doing it one by one thoughtfully, only when I have a grain of a specific idea for what I might be able to offer them and their students in the remote environment. After all, how else will they know what is possible? So far for fall, um, and I just started, two faculty have reached out to me and I've reached out to two others. And I wanted to share their responses. Um, of course, not all responses will be so great and positive. Um, many I expect will not respond at all. But these first steps and having a clear plan and approach and having some positive response have given me the confidence and the path to keep moving forward. Thank you so much. Um, I will be happy to answer your questions after the fact. Please feel free to email me. Um, there's a link to my slideshow and also to another sort of seize the moment um, post that I wrote for the university's teaching continuity site for faculty. There was sort of a vague call put out and just like with the work, the tour, I just immediately said, hey, I could write about this thing and then I figured it out after. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Thank you so much, Miriam, for your fantastic presentation. I really feel like it's great to have an idea of how to move forward intentionally um, and start reaching out to faculty despite all of the uncertainty of this time. Um, and we are right at noon. Um, I would like to once again thank our fantastic speakers for today. Um, and hopefully everyone has different ideas of how they can move forward at their own institutions. Um, we will be answering questions as I have promised, but we'll be doing them in a slightly different way to be sensitive to the time of the participants. Um, so we will be sending out a Google Doc um, of all of the answers to your questions that you've stuck in the chat and also on the Padlet. Um, if you have any questions um, after the fact, please get in touch with one of the speakers or with one of the organizers of this event and we'll make sure that you're put in touch um, and get an answer to that question. I also would like to give a very, very grateful thank you to all of those who have worked to plan this um, from picking speakers and reaching out and inviting them um, to working the logistics of making sure that this could be moved online. So thank you, Stephanie, Stacy, Colette, Bill, Kate, and Suzanne. Um, we'll be sending out an evaluation in the next few days, so please keep an eye out for that. Um, but otherwise, have a fantastic Thursday.